What's the first thing your body has to do after a workout? You stimulate growth first, hopefully. If you train hard enough and stimulated growth, you will grow, but it has to happen first of all. Recover. Recover. If you allow enough time for recovery, then you have to allow enough time for growth. If you do those three things, you stimulate growth, number one, allow enough time for recovery, it does take time, up to 48 hours in some cases, <laughs> depending upon the severity of the exercise and the volume of the exercise. Then another block of time is required for that growth to manifest itself. Growth never precedes recovery. Recovery always comes first. You don't need a 21-inch arm to survive, but you do, you do need to continually recover and replace your precious physical resources and reserves. If you didn't continually recover from exercise, obviously you would die very rapidly, very soon. You've got to stimulate growth first, high-intensity training, allow enough time for recovery, and then allow enough time for, for growth. If you train, again, before recovery takes place, then the growth process can't take place because now you've got to recover from that next workout again. If you allow enough time for recovery to take place, but not enough time for growth to take place, you still won't grow. It takes time to recover and it takes time to grow. So I'm saying you should rest from anywhere from 48 to 72 hours between workouts. Six day a week training is always a mistake for the purpose of building muscular mass. If you want to build definition or create definition, then you can't be active enough to train every day, all day, whatever you want to do. If you train, if you're fighting, you're fighting. Yeah. You're not I'm not talking about lo localized muscle recovery. I'm talking about recovery of the physical system as a whole. Localized muscle recovery actually takes place very rapidly. But you do 10 sets of squats, very, very heavy squats on Monday. Your legs may have recovered by Tuesday. You try to do a heavy back workout on Tuesday. You won't feel the inclination. Because your whole system has been called upon. Demands have been made upon all the body's recuperative subsystems. Not just the legs. The whole system is called upon. You've got to allow the whole body to recover, not just the legs. When you're doing specifically high intensity training, you're training specifically for muscular mass. You can train specifically for muscular mass or specifically for cardiovascular increase. This is where the term specificity of training comes in. If you want to train specifically for cardiovascular fitness, then you've got to do highly repetitive, low intensity exercises. High intensity training does not build the kind of cardiovascular fitness that low intensity training does. You've got to train low intensity, highly repetitive activities, jogging, bicycling, and so on and so forth. You will develop a certain amount as if as opposed to not doing any kind of activity. But it's not in the same order as real aerobic training. You've got to train specifically for one or the other. You can divide specificity and train a little bit for building uh, size and mass and a little bit for cardiovascular, but you won't improve as rapidly as if you train specifically for one or the other. In other words, you have a certain amount of adaptive ability. You, you can divide it 100% or give it 100% for developing mass or give it 100% for developing cardiovascular fitness. Or you can divide it in half, give half of it to developing cardiovascular fitness, and give it half to developing mass. But you won't improve as rapidly in either area by doing it that way. If you want to develop muscles as fast as you can, then train specifically for size and mass. If you want to develop cardiovascular fitness as fast as you can, train specifically for that. Don't divide it in two. The guys who are doing 20 sets of body part are dividing specificity. They may be inducing a little growth simulation, but not, but not that much because part of their training or their adaptive uh, reserve is going towards cardiovascular training. It may be that you don't have to train with 100%. <laughs> it's never been proven conclusively that, that you have to train with 100% intensity to induce maximum growth stimulation. Maybe it's only 85%. But there is definitely a threshold of intensity you've got to pass beyond to stimulate muscular growth. There's a certain threshold called the threshold of intensity beyond which you have to go to stimulate growth. 
Maybe it's only 85%, but I ask you the question, how do you accurately measure 85% intensity? There's only, there's only two, two measurements of intensity you can measure accurately, 0% and 100%. When you're not exerting yourself at all, that's 0% intensity. And when you're exerting yourself maximally, as hard as you possibly can, you can't push any harder, then you know you're pushing 100%. And when you're pushing 100%, you know you can't go any further, you know you've passed beyond the threshold of intensity. How can you go beyond 100%? It's impossible. Maybe you only needed 90%. But as long as you pass over 90%, you're safe. You know you've stimulated growth. So you're safe and going to failure every time. And there are some people who simply don't want to train this way. It's only recommended for those who want to stimulate maximal increases in size and strength. It's not for the casual enthusiast. It's for the serious bodybuilder, the obsessive nut. You've got to be a little crazy, one way or the other. But again, a lot of this can be chalked up to mental masturbation. All, the, all of the academics aside, what really counts is that you get your ass in the gym and train hard. And if you're training six to eight hours a day, you're not training hard. It's laudable from one standpoint. You're devoted. You're willing to <laughs> diligently put a lot of work in. But uh, that has nothing to do with progress. Sure, you point to a guy like Roy Callender, who's got the most muscular, heavily muscled physique in the world, who trains out eight hours a day. You try, try training eight hours a day and see what happens. You'll end up looking like a jockey. <laughs> a skinny little run. If these guys weren't taking steroids, they would look like jockeys. And you got to look back to the early part of the careers of these guys. Really, like Arnold. Arnold was a powerlifter in Austria. He had just about as much muscle mass when he came to America as he did when he was in Germany. What he succeeded in doing when he got here was getting rid, getting rid of all the baby fat. Which he succeeded in doing through sheer bend of, of physical activity. If you do anything for four hours a day on a reduced calorie diet, chopping down trees, what have you, jumping up and down, you're going to get ripped. You don't have to lift weights to get ripped. I've seen ripped athletes who never lifted weights just because of their high metabolic rates and reduced food intake or whatever. They had no subcutaneous fat, giving the illusion that they were ripped. The high intensity training or any kind of weight training actually doesn't burn that many calories. And the calories that it does burn are sugar calories. The worst way to train for definition, which is a misnomer in itself, is to, is to lift weights. Because weight training has to use sugar as fuel. It doesn't matter how you train. Mike Mincer's way or Arnold Schwarzenegger's way or Larry Scott's way. Weight training, and any kind of weight training, is it, it's considered a high intensity activity. And all high intensity activities depend entirely upon glucose as fuel. So if you're trying to lose weight or lose fat and get cut up, weight training is the worst way to do it. it I think it's 90% glucose to use. Whereas aerobic activities use up to 80 or 90% fat as fuel. So if you're looking to get cut up, use high intensity weight training, very brief periods of weight training to maintain your muscle mass and spend as much of the rest of the time as you have doing aerobic activities to burn fat. This is not an opinion, it's a, it's a fact. It can be backed up by any exercise physiologist, medical doctor, might